Hello! I'm your virtual friend. I'm Lizzie. Would you like to continue your previous session of Browsing Live Week? I could exercise you. This could be your phys ed. Cheat on your man, homie. Ah, I tried to sneak through the door, man. Can't make it. Can't make it. The shit's stuck. Out of my way, son! Door stuck! Door! You guys ready for your headliner this evening? I'm gonna need more energy. He's filming his fucking special. This is history in the... Nice to meet you all. My name is uh, Dia. Uh, my parents are immigrants. But uh, I was born here at Whistle Stop Bar, apparently. <laughs> My parents were refugees, but I didn't grow up poor. They found decent jobs when they came to this country. It's just that like, as refugees, they were like deeply frugal about everything they thought wasn't important. Like they would take me to Chuck E. Cheese all the time, but they would always get like the cheapest token package, which was like 12 tokens. <laughs> and I'd have to split those 12 tokens with my two other siblings. So I'd start Chuck E. Cheese with like four tokens. And that's not enough tokens where a kid can be a kid. <laughs> that's enough tokens where a kid can feel real poor, actually. And the confusing part is my parents were reasonably well off, so I was only poor at Chuck E. Cheese. You know how confusing that is? I grew up in a two-story house, but at Chuck E. Cheese, I had to play a lot of dry air hockey. <laughs> when you don't have many tokens at Chuck E. Cheese, you spend a lot of time playing in the tubes. Do you guys remember the Chuck E. Cheese tubes? But more importantly, do you guys remember the kind of kids in the Chuck E. Cheese tubes? Because on the ground, the kids are sophisticated. They're like, I've crunched the numbers, and this is the game that maximizes my ticket per token ratio. <laughs> Up in the tubes, the kids are like, y'all want to pretend to be rats? <laughs> <laughs> on the ground, there's like kids doing game theory. Up in the tube, there's a kid who's all he's doing is just blocking the tubes. <laughs> You guys have this bridge troll at your local Chuck E. Cheese? Just post it up, you're trying to get around him, and he's like, first you must answer these three riddles. <laughs> and at least the kids at the front of the Chuck E. Cheese tubes, they're just the ones who've like ran out of tokens too fast, but they still want to get down to the ground with their friends. Have you ever gone deep in the Chuck E. Cheese tubes? Because then you start meeting these kids who embrace the tube life. If you go deep in the tube, you start meeting these Pan's Labyrinth kids <laughs> who adapted to the darkness. You can't even make them out at first. You can only see them by their glowing Chuck E. Cheese hand stamp. <laughs> and if you make it past these godless freaks and journey deeper in the tube, the tubes start narrowing. You start seeing tally marks on the walls. You start passing like former members of the Chuck E. Cheese. You pass like a raccoon holding a tambourine. <laughs> you keep crawling, you keep going, the tubes go deep. By now you're not even in the Chuck E. Cheese anymore, you're in the liquor store across the street. It's not even multicolored plastic, it's white PVC pipe at some point. And then at the end you see a light. And at the end of the tubes, there's a ball pit. And in the ball pit sits a kid meditating. And as you approach, he opens his eyes and goes, I've been waiting a long time for you, <laughs> Dia. <laughs> and you get closer and you see an Adam's apple and some stubble. And you're like, this is not a child. This is a fucking 22 year old. Because <laughs> I first entered the tubes 15 years ago. <laughs> and now you take my place. <laughs> I think about Chuck E. Cheese a lot. <laughs> Because to me, Chuck E. Cheese is a little bit of like a microcosm of like capitalist society. Because if you work hard at Chuck E. Cheese and you do well, then you get rewarded in the end. And I kind of feel like the games you're drawn to as a kid in Chuck E. Cheese is like sort of indicative of like what jobs you get in society. My game was T-Ball, I was very mellow. And I would do, okay, I'd throw it up, 
make four to five tickets a game in honest middle class living at Chuck E. Cheese. Just clock in, clock out, pay my dues. But my best friend was this white kid named Jordan. And Jordan would only play that game where you like shoot a token into the coin bulldozer. Do you remember this game? That's a very different relationship with tokens. Every kid who played that coin bulldozer game is like really into cryptocurrency. Now, that's the same thing. Even back then I was like, hey buddy, you've made no tickets back. I think you're wasting your tokens. He's like, oh, it'll fall for me one day. <laughs> just hold, just keep slinging tokens in. I was like, I helped you. I started shaking it. He's like, stop it. That's market manipulation. <laughs> you can't do that. <laughs> Chuck E. Cheese really is your first encounter with like capitalist society. It's the first time you exchange currency that you earned for prizes. And something switches in your brain the first time you do something that you earned. Like you walk into Chuck E. Cheese thinking sharing is caring and you leave with a lot of opinions on private property. <laughs> I remember how different, because me and Jordan used to share everything before. We used to play, share video games, share food. But that first time I spent 200 tickets and got that whoopee cushion, and Jordan was like, can I see it? I was like, you never worked a goddamn day in your life, Jordan. You're a leech on society and you're a leech on me. I really think that's what Chuck E. Cheese is there for. It's indoctrinate kids into capitalism. It's like Tucker Carlson for kids. That's all Chuck E. Cheese is. There used to be this like, animatronic Chuck E. Cheese, and there's like a button, and you press the button, Chuck E. says catchphrases. The first few times you press it, Chuck E. says pretty normal things. The first time he says, anybody can be a winner. Then you, then you press it again, he said, save up your tickets and win a bigger prize. Chuck E. starts saying some pretty heinous shit after a while. By press A, Chuck E.'s like, wealth from the rich will trickle down to the poor. <laughs> By press nine, he's like, healthcare is a privilege, not a right. <laughs> After press 12, he just starts going Trump 2024. <laughs> Charles Entertainment Cheese endorses Trump. That's, and then he clarifies, just for his fiscal policies, not his social policies. <laughs> Chucky isn't racist. <laughs> Chucky Cheese taught me that there's some things that I can never afford in this life. The remote control helicopter in the back of Chucky e. Cheese costed 300,000 tickets. <laughs> What? You can't afford that with the Steve baller salary. I get Steve ball 40 hours a week, I'll never get. I remember once I was like protesting it and suddenly Jordan walked over with like 300,000 tickets and he got the remote control helicopter. And the employee just looks at me and sees, see, if you stop wasting your tickets on the whoopee cushions and the rubber sticky hands and you actually saved up, you could be like him but you got a poverty mentality. <laughs> and you'll never make it in America. <laughs> and for a second, I was like, well, I guess he pulled himself up by his bootstraps. The system works, the American dream right here. But then I thought, turns it out, that's so many fucking tickets, man. <laughs> so I asked him, I was like, hey buddy, how'd you, how'd you get this, how'd you get 300,000 tickets? And he goes, oh, I won some of these today. But actually, a lot of these from my older brother. He's too old for Chuck E. Cheese, so he just gave me the rest of his. But actually, most of these from my dad when he was a kid. <laughs> and that's when I learned that if you're white, Chuck E. Cheese did just kind of run in your family. <laughs> white people have Chuck E. Cheese generational wealth out here. My parents were refugees. I came to the Chuck E. Cheese with nothing, just the clothes on my back. <laughs> Jordan walked in with the Chuck E. Trust Fund. <laughs> And Jordan was old money. He bought a token. It was from 1835. It had a Confederate flag on the back. It didn't even have Chuck E. Cheese on it. It had a raccoon holding a tambourine. <laughs> I was at, uh, I was at Dave and Buster's. No, I'm joking. I'll move on. It did teach me something. It taught me that that's like one of the main advantages of being like white in America, is you get like access to like generations worth of like family connections and resources. And I never quite appreciated this until I started like applying for jobs. Like I remember uh, I was unemployed last year and I was applying to hundreds of jobs. 
<laughs> once I got rejected from a job 15 minutes after I sent the application in. Do you know how bad it feels to get rejected from a job for being unqualified? When you're already lying about your qualifications? <laughs> Like nothing on that resume was true. <laughs> that means that even the version of me with two extra GPA points, three extra years of industry experience, and is a disabled protected veteran. <laughs> even that deal was unqualified to become a Costco greeter. And it was so confusing. I was like, why is it so hard for me to find a job? I thought I did everything right. I went to like a decent college, got a practical major. Even when I did get a job, it's not a good job. I don't make crazy money. I know that because my, uh, my friend asked me what my annual salary was. I had to go to one of those hourly wage to annual salary converters. <laughs> if you ever have to use one of those converters, you're not making crazy money. <laughs> No one's ever had to do their hourly wage times 40 hours a week times 52 weeks a year and had six figures come out at the end of that. That's never happened. In that equation, hourly wage times 40 times 52, in my salary, the 40 and the 52 are doing a lot of the heavy lifting there. My salary is pretty close to 40 times 52. So it was really confusing to me. I was like, why is it so hard to get a job that pays reasonably? But then I would have all these friends who would get these incredible jobs straight out of college. Like Jordan, I remember straight out of college, got a six-figure software engineering job at Dell. But here's the thing. Jordan's full name is Jordan Dell. <laughs> and I never put the pieces together on how I got it. Same with my other buddy, got a six-figure prestigious media job straight out of college. His name is Travis Barstool Sports. <laughs> And I'm just, I'm sick of it. I'm sick of some guy telling me to work hard and trust the process. And turns out as a great grandfather invented shoelaces or something. <laughs> Cause that really is like the quiet part of white privilege. Like the loud part is like some white guy who murders nine people and gets Saturday school <laughs> after it. <laughs> but the quiet part is just millions of mediocre white guys getting jobs through nepotism. And that's why I think that if we want to go out to rich people, and I think we should, I just think we should start with the rich people who didn't earn any of their money, who just inherited their money. Yeah. Like, instead of first going after Jeff Bezos, I think we should start by going after a man named Preston Bezos. <laughs> Jeff's 19-year-old son, who at 19 is already attending Princeton and is the CEO of his own startup engineering company. So I found Preston's Instagram. <laughs> and I bully him. <laughs> because that's how we make change. Because <laughs> every day, people stand outside Jeff's factories protesting, asking for better working conditions, and nothing ever gets done. But every evening, I DM Preston <laughs> and remind him that his parents got divorced. <laughs> And after seven consecutive days, Jeff raised the minimum wage. So I think it's doing something. <laughs> if there's no trickle down economics, there might be trickle up cyberbullying. I really, just work your way up to Jeff. We really need to be like the bad guys in action films. So they don't go after like the main characters himself. They go after the main characters loved ones. We need to do that. <laughs> Like in the Taken films, they don't go after Taken himself. They go after Taken's wife and Taken's kids. And we got three Taken films after that. What I'm saying is we want there to be wealth distribution, stop voting, and start doing ransoms. <laughs> A ransom is just grassroots wealth distribution. Because <laughs> if you want to pass a wealth tax, it has to go through the House and through the Senate, and that will never happen. Or... <laughs> We can cut up a magazine <laughs> and send Jeff a letter that says, if you ever want to see Preston again, <laughs> donate 30% of your wealth to these local mutual aid organizations. I'm not saying we should kidnap Preston Bezos. Literally, I'm not saying we should kidnap Preston Bezos. 
But hypothetically, <laughs> if we were to, we wouldn't have to be violent. We don't need to like tie his hands and feet together and throw him in a trunk. Just make him sit in the bad seat of a Honda Civic. <laughs> He's like, this is the worst day of my life. I've never had this little late room. <laughs> don't lock him in a basement. Just make him stay in a studio apartment with no AC and come crawling home to daddy. <laughs> Legally, I'm not condoning <laughs> kidnapping Preston Bezos. But I will say, you can order chloroform online. <laughs> I just ordered some chloroform online. From Amazon Prime, actually. <laughs> I get here in two days, and you guys can use referral code DIA for 20%. <laughs> uh, I'm not saying if you have rich parents, it means you're a bad person. You shouldn't be ashamed. You don't choose who your parents are. You shouldn't be ashamed if you have rich parents. I just think that if you do have rich parents, you should have to disclose it. <laughs> like when you walk into rooms and shit. <laughs> like a sex offender. <laughs> because this is a free show on a Wednesday, but there's people with rich parents here right now. <laughs> hanging out with us, <laughs> joking around with us, sending us Venmo requests and shit. <laughs> I'll find you, I'll Blade Runner this room right now. I'll point you out. It's crazy, I started doing research for this joke about like nepotism, and it's, it's insane how many successful people, if you just go like one step up in their family tree, it's just like a rich parent financing all of it. It's crazy how many musicians are just financed by rich parents. I think that's why musicians have stage names. <laughs> it's not very punk rock when your last name sounds a lot like J.P. Morgan Chase. <laughs> Look it up, I'm telling you, if you take like all the CEOs in the Fortune 500 and put their last name on a poster, it looks suspiciously a lot like the Lollapalooza lineup <laughs> this year. But it's every, it's all, not just me, it's all successful people like Charles Darwin. He also, you think you can just go to the Galapagos on your own dime? <laughs> and Darwin is sitting there writing like, successful organisms pass their favorable traits to their offspring. Like, oh, I wonder what inspired that. <laughs> Charlie. <laughs> and I want to bring this all to light. I want to become the Martin Luther King Jr. of nepotism. <laughs> By the way, Martin Luther King Jr.? <laughs> it's all nepotism. It goes so deep in this country. Like, you guys think it's a coincidence that the Messiah is also the Son of God? <laughs> you think he earned that position based on pure righteousness? Who do you think is going to get that position? The guy named Simon, Peter, or the guy whose last name is King of the Jews? <laughs> And Jesus was a bad messiah. He was not good at his job. Do you know how I know that? Because he got crucified at the end. That's how you know you're bad at your job. If you're working a nine to five and at the five you get crucified, you're not doing too well. And Jesus got bailed out of death by his death. That's good connections. I remember he wasn't crucified alone. There's these poor chaps whose dads weren't shit crucified next to him. Jesus had to step over their body, being like, just trust the process, guys, just. <laughs> I wanna quit the internet. So I think the internet is making me dumb. Anyone else kinda feel like this? Yeah. That it's making us stupider? Cause I wanna be informed, but I just end up reading what smart people say on there, and I say it out loud to people in conversation. <laughs> like me and my buddy, we're talking about the Ukraine-Russia war. He brought it up. And then he just suddenly goes, uh, yeah, man, I think the US should have sent troops to help out Ukraine. And I just wanted to engage and sound like I knew stuff, so I just went, no, man. <laughs> the US never learned our lessons from Vietnam. And then he went, what lessons did we learn from Vietnam? And I said, what? <laughs> and then he went, do you know anything that happened in Vietnam? And I said, I do know. I know we sent 
our troops over there. And then the Viet Cong ambushed a platoon. And then one of our top lieutenants lost both his legs. <laughs> and then he started a shrimp business. <laughs> Most historical footage I've seen has Tom Haynes digitally inserted in the back. I thought AIDS mostly affected white women who sang country songs. <laughs> I don't think they had to give Jenny AIDS. I don't have more to that statement. It just felt, <laughs> just felt a little forced to me. <laughs> we get it's the 70s, just give her the flu. You don't have to give her AIDS. <laughs> I want to get off the internet. It's also just like, it's just bad because of how much sad shit is like on there. I had to start a GoFundMe page recently to help pay for my uncle's funeral. And it's already managed to go of $5,000 which is a bit bittersweet because the GoFundMe campaign for his heart surgery did not do nearly as well. <laughs> He's still alive. He still wants the heart surgery. <laughs> but we started the campaign for his funeral at the same time we started the campaign for his heart surgery. We were like, let the people decide what happens. <laughs> and the people wanted him to have a bombast funeral. <laughs> There'll be magicians. <laughs> I'll do a set, maybe. <laughs> GoFundMe is bad. It's just like only the saddest shit on there. It used to not, like GoFundMe in 2015, you could like raise money for your stool soccer team. Nowadays, every time GoFundMe is like a Greek tragedy. <laughs> every campaign it's like, I'm tied to a rock and an eagle is picking out my liver. <laughs> okay, Prometheus, I'll give you $15, I guess. It's made me like a worse person. It makes me jaded, because I just compare anything I see on there to like the worst thing on there. Like, my, I had a high school friend who started a campaign because she was just diagnosed with stage one cancer. And the first thought in my head was like, that's not that much cancer. <laughs> <laughs> They're bringing stage one to go fund me? <laughs> the bid leads? <laughs> You should let that metastasize just a little longer for bringing this pussy shit, too. <laughs> and she wanted $50,000. I don't know how much cancer costs. <laughs> that feels like stage three cancer money to me. So do you price match? Do you have honey? Can we haggle a little bit? <laughs> it's really hard for me to quit the internet because I've been on the internet my whole life. I've been on the internet since 2005 when I was eight. And that's a bad time to be on the internet. That's too young. In 2005, it was just me and pedophiles. That was the internet. <laughs> just eight-year-olds and sexual predators. In 2005, this was before Chris Hansen caught them all. <laughs> Do you guys remember To Catch a Predator? That's what it was called, by the way. To Catch a Predator. Not How to Catch a Predator. Not Chris Hansen Catches Predator. It was called To Catch a Predator. Why was it so literary? <laughs> What an existential question <laughs> to catch it. To catch a predator or not to catch a predator? <laughs> no, Chris, catch him. Catch him, I think. <laughs> catch him, Chris. In 2005, the, the internet was only three things. It was predators, it was computer viruses, and it was two girls, one cup. That's all the internet. That's the holy trifecta. That's how you knew the internet was gonna be good, by the way. <laughs> Because we all saw Two Girls, One Cup, and we just kept using the internet. <laughs> like, that's how good Wikipedia was, that we saw Two Girls, One Cup, and it just hit Control-T. <laughs> like, if this show started with two women eating each other's shit, you wouldn't be like, I hope Dia's good. <laughs> like, I'm never watching comedy again. <laughs> I mean, 2005 was like the wild west of the internet, but I kind of miss when it was like anonymous. I think it's actually better than how the internet is nowadays. I had my first relationship on the internet way back then. I was a, I was a nine year old boy <laughs> pretending to be a 19 year old man. <laughs> and my girlfriend was this 19 year old woman who I'm realizing now was probably also a nine year old boy. <laughs> we hit it off a little too well, you know? 
We're like, our favorite things are both drinking beer and Toy Story 2. <laughs> now, I really miss a lot of the old internet, even computer viruses. I kind of felt like they were important. They were important at stopping stupid people from going down like internet rabbit holes. Because right now, I feel like half the anti-vaxxers and all these conspiracy theorists are just people who Google something and they just get like the best manifestos. There's no more computer viruses now, by the way. They've been eradicated. <laughs> you know how I know that? It says my dad wanted to watch like the NBA playoffs, but he doesn't have cable. <laughs> So what he says, he goes on Google and types in, illegal NBA streams free. <laughs> and he clicks the first link, and it works incredible. <laughs> he sees all the playoffs. If you never use one of these like illegal sports streams, they're great quality, they don't lag. There's one downside, there's a chat box <laughs> where people just say the N-word. That's the only point. <laughs> it's distracting, you're trying to watch the game, and out of the corner of your eye, your dad calling LeBron the N-word. <laughs> Stop it, dad. <laughs> I really wish there were computer viruses nowadays. I'm most worried for my dad, because my dad is the most gullible person I know, and I'm worried he'll Google the wrong thing and just get like, radicalized. He uh, bought fake Ray-Bans from his own hacked Facebook account. <laughs> Do you guys understand what happened? <laughs> Someone hacked his account and posted from his account fake Ray-Bans. Then he saw himself post and was like, that's a great deal. <laughs> from somebody I trust, actually. <laughs> it was posted eight times, four were the hackers, the other four were him trying to spread the word. <laughs> I really think I would have been a conspiracy theorist back in like 2005 if it wasn't for computer viruses. Because one day in elementary school, Jordan came with very compelling evidence why the moon landing was fake. And I went, okay, I'll do my research. <laughs> and I went on Google, I typed in moon landing fake, I clicked the first link. And what came up was this video of these two women eating each other's shit. <laughs> it was two girls, one cup, but here's the thing, I didn't go further into the moon landing thing. I was like, it probably happened then. <laughs> That's how you knew something was fake back in 2005. Like instead of the misinformation vaccine label, they're just two girls, one cup popping up right under it. I really think there is this like connection between like technological illiteracy and like having poor views. I think they come hand in hand. Because one day uh, during family dinner, my dad, no one's talking, and my dad just blurts out, you know how we stop racism? <laughs> and he goes, racism will go away if we just stop talking about it. I feel like the people who say that racism will go away if we just stop talking about it are for some reason all the same people who think that switching off the monitor shuts off the whole computer. <laughs> racism has been around for thousands of years and my dad's computer has been on for about the same amount of time. <laughs> I'm, I'm 25 and uh, I'm single. And I feel the clock ticking a little bit. I feel like I'm running out of time. <laughs> but the reason is, is I refuse to be over 30 and single. And I have a good reason. I think that if you're over 30 and single, you're pretty embarrassing to be around. Because <laughs> that means something about you, right? If you're over 30 and single, that reflects something deep inside. So I met people in their 20s and single. I'm like, oh, how come no one snapped you up? Every person who's over 30 and single, I'm like, oh, I get why no one loves you <laughs> right now. <laughs> and it's your personality. It's, it's the inside that counts, and it's the inside that's been rejected from companionship. I think we should, uh, I think we should draft people who are over 30 and single into war, I think. <laughs> Just so they feel chosen for once. I also get these fuckers out of here. They're fucking up the vibe. <laughs> Osama was married. <laughs> Bin Laden. <laughs> and he lived in a cave. What's your excuse? <laughs> I think that if you're over 30 and single, you should try dating somebody. <laughs> okay, I'll stop. <laughs> um, that's me. I'm, I think I'm just 
bitter. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't date in high school, and I will have my revenge. <laughs> Anyone here not date in high school? A couple of us. A couple of us who still keep in touch with our English teachers. <laughs> We're underrepresented, by the way. Us who didn't date in high school, like in movies and media and stuff. Every high schooler in one of these movies has a very active dating life. If you're a high schooler in a TV show, you're more likely to have superpowers than to be single. <laughs> if you want to see the kids in these high school shows who aren't dating, you have to look in the background. Like in Euphoria, in the foreground, there's two teenagers making out. Look in the background, you'll just see eight kids playing Yu-Gi-Oh in the hallway. <laughs> like in the foreground, they're just Peter Parker making out with Gwen Stacy. Just behind him, out of focus, is a guy who looks like me, being like, Peter, please log into the Doodle Doc. It's due tomorrow. <laughs> I didn't date in high school, but uh, I sort of wish, I, I feel like I missed some important developmental step. Because I'm dating my mid-twenties, and the dates are too adult for me. I'm, I, don't, I don't feel mature, I don't really... Like my last date, this is what we did. We went to a cooking class together, and then after we went to a used bookstore and bought each other books. I never wanted this horse shit. <laughs> I still want a high school relation... I don't want to date a high schooler, but I want... like a high school relationship. Do you ever been partnered up with your crush and asked to discuss? That's a high that you'll never... We partner, and she'd be like, oh, what do you think are the themes of, in, of Mice and Men? And he'd be like, who? Who do you like? <laughs> who do you like? I won't tell anybody. <laughs> that was my go-to move in high school, who do you like? I wasn't ready to date, but I would fall in love, scheme to get close to somebody, go, who do you like? And they would say someone else, and I'd be devastated. I do this 50 times a school year, and... <laughs> That was enough for me. <laughs> but there was something romantic about like dating high school when like everybody knew everybody. And there was like, I wish I dated when there was rumors. That's a high school only thing, by the way, rumors. If you're an adult and there's a rumor about you, <laughs> it's bad. <laughs> if you're an adult and there's a rumor that's called an allegation, actually. <laughs> But you used to be able to like announce a relationship on Facebook. That might be the best love gets, by the way. The high of love through the eons of civilization might be, it's 2012, you're a junior in high school, you announce a relationship on Facebook, and you get 60 likes. <laughs> that might be the best it gets. Do you remember 60 likes in 2012? That's when 60 likes hit differently. <laughs> That's when every, that was everybody on Facebook in 2012. Obama's inauguration in 2012 got 37 likes. <laughs> Nowadays, like, the UDO hallway kids are getting three digit likes on Instagram. There's a major like inflation. <laughs> Since, that's not a glow up, that's an unstable like economy, actually. But a uh, 2012 like? An uncut pure 2012 like? No bots, no fashion brands, just people you respect. <laughs> Remember when a like was so good, you click on the profile of the person who liked it just to savor it a little bit? <laughs> hey, San Diego, this was a joy. Thank you so much, everybody. Yeah.